Welcome to Watch Clutch Babylon Berlin Season 2. Uh, my name is Raleigh Joyner. I'm the Goethe Institute Washington Programming Coordinator. Um, I'm currently broadcasting out of Tacoma Park, Maryland, so not far from DC. We are still in home office. Um, we hope that you are all safe and healthy and uh, doing the best you can in, uh, in, in enjoying your summer. And um, we're really happy to have you um, here for one final edition for the summer of our Watch Clutch series, which we are so happy that it has been well received. Um, and we're going to wrap up with season two, episodes seven and eight. Um, we decided to go ahead and hold off season three for next summer um, when people might need something else to do. Uh, and watch, and uh, we don't want to give people Babylon Berlin fatigue, and also knowing that um, it's possible that season four may be available by then, um, and even if not, season three is a bit long, so um, we'll have something to work with if, uh, if yeah, in, the, in, 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 in next summer as well, so we hope that we can bring it back next summer, but for now, we can enjoy episodes seven and eight with um, our sort of docent, I don't know what the best term to use, our, our Virgil of the, that's, that's, that's too pretentious, um, that leads us to Babylon Berlin Universe, um, who ha, uh, has been leading us so well through the last uh, now almost seven um, sessions, uh, Dr. Hester Baer uh, from the University of Maryland College Park. Um, she's an associate professor of German and film studies over at the UM, University of Maryland. Uh, where she also serves as a core faculty member in the Comparative Literature Program. And she has published widely on German film, digital media, contemporary literature, and feminism. She's the author of Dismantling the Dream Factory, G Gender, German Cinema, and the Post-War Quest for a New Film Language from 2009, and German Cinema in the Age of Neoliberalism, which is to be published later this year, if I'm right, in 2020. Um, so thanks so much for Hes to Hester for being here today and also for uh, sort of guiding us through these past, yeah, now almost seven sessions. And also a special thank you to Jill Smith, who was with us last session. And we had sort of a mega clutch where we talked about quite a lot of things. So if you were joining us for that one, that one was a lot of fun too, because um, we had an extra person to sort of uh, clutch with. And so, um, yeah, and another thank you also to um, Friends of the Goethe Institute, Foggy, for continuing to support our programming and for funding this particular series. Um, as you all may have noticed, uh, I sent out the Zoom meeting, which was like post clutch clutch, which is just a Zoom meeting link. Um, that was like, if you would like to sort of informally go into a meeting after the webinar is over, you are welcome to do that and in that setting we will have for once you know sort of the um the op the option for 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 cameras and microphones and you know maybe more formal talking for i don't know maybe a half an hour or so um so once again a, another big thank you to all of you who have been tuning in to these sessions and watching them on YouTube and telling your friends about them and colleagues it's been really wonderful to see the audience sort of um feedback and to see people with the same sort of names uh, come back and, and tune in. Uh, we really appreciate your support of our programming, especially in this time. And it's been really great to sort of find something that uh, people have enjoyed um, doing in this, in this time where it's, it's kind of hard <laughs> to find things to enjoy doing. Um, so we really appreciate that. And um, just, uh, as a last thing, just stay tuned. Uh, we do have two things in the works. We as in Goethe Washington have two things in the works um, before summer is out, hopefully. Um, at that, and by that I mean like September, um, that further engage with Babylon Berlin in different ways. Um, so we'll keep you updated about those. Um, but for now, I will go ahead and just say once again, thank you, welcome, and uh, I will hand this over to Hester and mute me. Thanks, Raleigh. By the way, I don't think I got the link for the Zoom meeting after. Ooh, let me drop that in the chat. So, yeah. I'll do that when I disappear. 
Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you again uh, for being here and welcome to our final episode of Watch Clutch for 2020. Um, and I would like to express my sincere gratitude one more time to Raleigh Joyner of the Grit Institute in Washington, DC for all of his work in organizing this series and his excellent moderation and participation in the conversation. I'm coming to you all again from my house in Silver Spring, Maryland, and it's been really such a pleasure to hear your thoughts and ideas about Babylon Berlin um, and, and also to field your questions over the past month, and I'm really looking forward to our final conversation tonight. This evening, we will be discussing the final two episodes of season two of the show, episodes seven and eight or 15 and 16. Um, these episodes resolve several of the plot lines that have driven the narrative of Babylon Berlin throughout the first two seasons, which as I have mentioned, were both conceived of as one continuous story and created in one extended seven month shoot. So they are kind of of a piece. Um, and season three, which you can go ahead and watch now if you haven't done so already, um, kind of moves on into a totally new direction. It's adapted from the second of Volker Kutcher's novels um, in the Gary and Rat series. Um, that novel is called uh, Der Stumme Tod in German. I forget how it's translated in English right now, but a silent death or something along those lines. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click over to my slides. Oops, Raleigh, my slide share is disabled. Why do I always do that? Hold on a second. <laughs> All right, you should be good now. There you go. Okay. So I was uh, talking about the resolution of some of the plot lines that have driven the narrative of the show so far. Um, at long last, Lotta receives her official police badge. We finally learn that the Sorokin gold is hiding in plain view, stored not inside the tra train car, but actually comprising the train car itself, as you hopefully can see here. Uh, and we see Garion Rat recover the painful memory of abandoning his wounded brother on the battlefield, a prelude to the revelation that Anno Rat in fact did not die in World War I, but like the Sorokin gold, has been right there all along, masquerading as Dr. Anno Schmidt. Indeed, these episodes contain many revelations about the deceptive appearances and characters who turn about deceptive appearances and characters who turn out to be different than they at first seemed. Bruno Wolter's deliberate attempt to commit vehicular manslaughter against Gerion and Lotta unmasks once and for all the evil that lurks within this complex character. Svetlana Sorokina, already known for her dual identity as the drag performer Nikaros, turns out not to be a white Russian countess at all, but rather the daughter of the chauffeur who liquidated the Sorokines and expropriated their wealth during the Russian Revolution. Always an ambiguous character, Garion Rat is exposed not only as a coward on the battlefield, but also as something of a turncoat who lies under oath, giving false testimony about the police shooting of unarmed civilians on May Day. And perhaps most shocking is the revelation, which we experience through the eyes of Greta, that the ostensible communist Fritz is actually a Nazi brown shirt. As Greta realizes only when it is too late, Fritz and his nasty sidekick Otto have groomed her to collude in the murder of Benda, planting Greta as a maid in Benda's house, and then manipulating her to believe that he is responsible for ordering the police to shoot Fritz a shooting that we now realize was staged purely for Greta's benefit. Greta's encounter with Fritz on the train platform as she attempts to flee Berlin after setting the bomb that will kill Benda and his small daughter represents the first time in the 15 episodes that we see a depiction of uniformed Nazis in Babylon Berlin. Indeed, Fritz's appearance as a Nazi is doubly uncanny here since we not only knew him as a communist, but we actually also thought he was dead. 
the slow reveal of Fritz's true political allegiance offers a key example of the show's strategy to demonstrate in co-creator Henk Han Lüchten's words that, quote, all these Nazis did not just fall from the sky. They were human beings who reacted to German society's changes and they made their decisions accordingly, end of quote. The scene on the platform specifically emphasizes the violence of the SA, the Sturmabteilung, or paramilitary wing of the Nazi party that played an important role in Hitler's rise to power. By dramatizing the convergence of Fritz's emotional and physical abuse of Greta, whom he pretends not to know and then savagely beats, with a public display of brutality on view in the brown shirts rally against Weimar democracy, manifested here in their invective against the sitting mayor of Berlin, Gustav Buss, and then culminating in Benda's murder. While the murder of Benda and other events taking place in these episodes are fictionalized, the Sklarek scandal, which Benda tells Greta about during the tension-filled dinner that they share after she has set the fuse on the bomb in his desk, and which forms the ostensible reason for the SA rally on the train plat platform, is based on historical fact. Um, the Sklarek brothers, Leo, Max, and Willi, were the owners of a clothing supply company with a lucrative monopoly contract to supply the city of Berlin with municipal uniforms and linens. Um, they, gave, they made and supplied linens for hospitals and also uniforms for city employees, including the police. The brothers exploited this contract by drafting fake invoices for deliveries that never happened, ultimately defrauding the city of Berlin of more than 10 million marks. Following their arrest in September of 1929, and so again, the timelines and the show are a little bit off from the actual historical timelines of these events. Um, they were arrested in September 1929, and following that arrest, the brothers admitted to having bribed various officials, um, including some prominent social Democrats, by offering them gifts and bargains on low-priced furs. In November of 1929, then Bus, the mayor, a member of the left liberal Deutsche Demokratische Partei, resigned from his position as Oberbürgermeister due to his involvement in the scandal. Um, among other things, his wife had been able to purchase a fur, quote, fur coat for a fraction of its actual cost. The Sklarek scandal, and I'm kind of dwelling on it here for this reason, contributed to the growing instability of Weimar democracy in several ways that make its inclusion in Babylon Berlin noteworthy. First, it added to the widespread suspicion of the Social Democrats as corrupt bureaucrats and hypocrites, a suspicion that was stoked by the Communist Party and the Nazi Party alike. Uh, both groups exploited the collusion of the Social Democrats with the Sklareks for ideological purposes, um, duly noting that two of the brothers had actually joined the Social Democratic Party in 1928. In this regard, the scandal contributed to a growing disconnect between the party's professed goal of representing the working classes and its emergent image cultivated strongly by its opponents during this period as a bastion of moguls and swindlers. Finally, and perhaps most crucially, the Sklarek story fueled anti-Semitic propaganda that portrayed the SPD, the Social Democratic Party, as the party of the Jewish community. Specific attacks on the Sklareks themselves as Eastern European Jews fomented conspiracy theories about Marxist Jewish plots to bilk German taxpayers out of their money. And historians have documented how the Sklarek scandal played actually a prominent role in losses um, that the SPD experienced um, and gains by both the KPD, the Communist Party, and the NSDAP, the Nazi Party, in subsequent elections taking place in late 1929 and early 1930. In Babylon, Berlin, we first learn about the Sklarek scandal in episode 11, when Lotta helps her friend Doris check invoices for police uniforms against delivery receipts, um, and they discover that the invoices have been drastically inflated. In episode 15, Benda regales Greta with an animated description of the police investigation of the Sklareks, um, and later the SA thugs on the train platform shout at the mayor, uh, who's trying to depart on the train, Bus, you pig, your wife's got what? 
fur and mink on her Jewish bod. It is certainly no accident that Kreita's discovery of Fritz's duplicity is thus set against the backdrop of the Slark scandal, since this historical episode underscores how, although the communists and the Nazis shared very little ideologically, they did coincide in their criticism of the Social Democrats in ways that ultimately proved fatal for the Weimar Republic. Like the show's depiction of the events of Bloody May that we talked about in detail um, in the first season, which had exacerbated extant conflicts between the communists and the social democrats and prevented them from uniting against the rise of Nazism, the Sklarek scandal provides kind of a focal point for Babylon Berlin's portrayal of the complex alignments and the failure to achieve consensus that fueled the Republic's demise. Fritz's duplicity his Janus-based appearance, first as a communist and then as a Nazi, culminates in the bombing of Benda's home. The killing off of Benda, the show's most developed Jewish character, as we've discussed, in tandem with the destruction of his house, marks the incursion of Nazism into Babylon Berlin through the parallel depiction of anti-Semitic violence against both people and property, um, and the erosion of the boundary between the public and private spheres. Crucial for the rise of Nazism, the erosion of this boundary went hand in hand with the curtailing of individual liberties and the ubiquity of surveillance. Um, and in this regard, I think it's quite noteworthy that these two episodes depict virtually no domestic spaces other than Benda's. Lotta no longer returns to her home. We never see Bruno's apartment or actually ever see his wife, Emmy, again. Um, and Helga and Gerion explicitly comment, they have a kind of a discussion about the transitory nature of their dwelling in this hotel. Well, episodes 15 and 16 emphasize the importance, as I think the show as a whole does emphasize once again, the importance of learning to look and decipher clues. Um, for instance, in this rather metatextual scene when Lotta and Gerion contemplate the painting in Sorokina's apartment, um, and leading to their ability to figure out both the identity of the mysterious countess and the secret of the hidden gold. Uh, the Sorokin gold proves to be the ultimate MacGuffin in Babylon Berlin, a cipher for the show's action that pulls the characters away from what ought to be the true object of their attention. And in this way, Greta is really not the only one who fails to comprehend the reality behind the bomb plot. Pursuing the gold draws all the detectives away from Berlin and into the outdoor spaces of the rural landscape, uh, which is really a marked change of setting for the show, which has typically emphasized many interior spaces and urban locations. Just as he had intervened in Operation Prangertag, Rat arrives at the Kilometerstein or mile marker 127 just in time to intercept the train. But as Volter aptly tells him, you're no hero. Um, his pursuit of the train, in fact, prevents Rat from seeing the worst crimes about to transpire back in Berlin. And though Gerion and Lotta eventually solve the secret of the gold, we never actually learn what happens to it or the train. The train kind of goes off, um, and later we see Sorokina in Paris. Meanwhile, when she finally grasps the implication of Fritz's deception, Greta races back to Bendis to warn him, but she is too late and the bomb explodes just as she arrives on the scene. In their cultivation of unease and precariousness, and this is a kind of a theme that I've drawn out across the two first seasons, these episodes of Babylon Berlin repeatedly play with expanded and compressed time scales like Rat's just in time and Greta's too late. Similarly, they exacerbate our sense of insecurity by showing a panoply of characters who die and come back to life. In addition to Fritz, uh, who again, we've seen being shot and thought dead, and then he uncannily appears um, back again on the train platform, which is very shocking to Greta. Um, there's also Anno, who was recently declared officially dead, but now reveals himself to be alive. 
Sorokina, who slits her own throat on stage at a Paris cabaret, um, and this act is subsequently revealed to be a performance. Her erstwhile lover, Kardakov, whom we last glimpsed with grave injuries, but who now appears unscathed in the Paris audience. Um, and of course, Lotta, who having been frozen to death earlier this season, now drowns in episode 15, only to sputter back to life at long last in episode 16. Lotta's death appears particularly cruel and manipulative since what can only be a matter of seconds in real life or in the you know, real diegesis of the show stretches temporally across many minutes and a couple of episodes, testing our patience and stretching credibility. Um, and this leads me to wonder whether we should consider this scene Babylon Berlin's jumping the shark moment, a rather over the top and unwelcome change in style and mood in the trajectory of this show, um, a show that really doesn't need any gimmicks. Um, and for those of you who maybe haven't heard this term before, it derives from an episode of Happy Days pictured here in which the Fonz literally jumps over a shark while on water skis, a, a scene you know, that's clearly not in keeping with the um, tenor of the show Happy Days. Um, so, and here you have that juxtaposed with the, the car plunging into the lake outside of Berlin. Um, one way or another, like the season one finale, these episodes wear their artifice on their sleeve escalating the action quite dramatically and deploying every trick in the TV screenplay handbook. In addition to the MacGuffin of the Sorokin gold, we have various red herrings, Chekhov's guns and Easter eggs. Um, uh, and so if you notice some of those things, I would be very interested in hearing your, your comments or thoughts about them. I think these two episodes kind of depart in all of these ways that I've been trying to outline from the sort of style uh, and tenor of the show up until this point. Um, and so I've been thinking about why, why they make the choice to do that and what motivation the showrunners might have had other than sort of craven ideas about marketing and, and wanting to get um, the, the budget for a, set, a third season. Um, our heroine Lotte is notably absent from the climactic action of episode 16, including the showdown between Voltaire and Rat, since she is confined now to a hospital to recover from drowning. In a strange sequence um, that you see a couple of images from here, Lotte and Helga are depicted in parallel shots as they both wake in bed somehow aware of the grave threat to Rat's life as he plunges from the train car. And this is one of those um, scenes in the kind of action-packed showdown between Bruno and Gerion, where Gerion's standing on top of the train and a swarm of sort of flock of birds comes flying toward him while the train is, is going at great speeds and he ducks and ends up falling down and, and remarkably is, is unscathed by this fall, but the two women wake up and somehow feel what's happening. This sequence renders both of the women as passive sexualized recipients of telepathic communications, strongly reminiscent of those received by Ellen, the vampire's sacrificial victim in Murnau's 1922 film Nosferatu. And I um, show some parallel images here of Lotta and Helga and Ellen in Nosferatu. The ubiquity of undead characters in Babylon Berlin um, returns us to the terrain of Weimar cinema where monsters, automatons, and somnambulists play such a meaningful role. And also to the show's insistent framing of Weimar's problems as originating in the social, economic, political, and psychic traumas of World War I. The choice to end the show with the desublimation of Gerion Rath's original trauma is significant in this regard. Um, and it's interesting, I think, that if you recall, the show is really framed with these two episodes of hyp hypnosis. Uh, ep episode one of season one um, shows Gerion um, being hypnotized by Anno, and we return to that same kind of scene here in the uh, final episode of season two. Um, and I would be quite interested to hear how you all responded to this ending. Uh, first, though, I would like to just offer a few brief comments on the opening and closing credit sequences of Babylon Berlin, which seem like a kind of fitting way to conclude my watch clutch presentations. 
It is something of a truism in film studies that credit sequences condense the formal aesthetic language um, as well as the thematic content of a given film or series, offering a kind of capsule version of what is to come. Um, and I personally am duly horrified by the skip intro function on Netflix and firmly believe that credits are always part of, it, of every episode, an integral part that must be viewed. Um, so I, I did want to comment on these credits. Um, in the case of Babylon Berlin, I find the credit sequences remarkably artistic in their composition. Um, but I also find them important because they do enact in miniature what I like about the show as a whole. Um, and that is its kind of mashup style that we've talked a lot about that blends elements of past and present and this kind of collage aesthetic of assembling um, new images from found materials. And as we can see here, the opening credits kind of draw attention to the history of German cinema, um, in particular echoing the logo of the Ufa film company that dominated film production in the Weimar period. Um, and I think you can see that in sort of in the color and shape of this um, uh, um, opening sequence. Much of Babylon Berlin was actually shot at the studio Babelsberg on the grounds that formerly housed the Ufa studios. Um, and the credits are rife with stylistic effects that were common in films produced by Ufa during the Weimar period as well. Uh, things like double exposures, like you see here, um, montage, iris effects, um, tinting, and more. And here we can also see how the credits evoke the materiality of analog film. And that's something that I highlighted a lot, um, especially in talking about the first season, the way that analog film and photography play a role within the uh, storyline of the show so prominently. Um, and this uh, actually comes back really strongly in season three as well. Um, so here we see this, the way the credits capture the kind of speckling of chemical deterioration and the scratches and bubbles of the fragile celluloid form. As the film scholar Sarah Hall has observed in a just published article on Babylon Berlin, and I think it's one of the first kind of um, scholarly articles to come out, we can add that to the Google Doc um, that Raleigh has been maintaining. Um, uh, she, she talks about how the credits also uh, imitate cinematic projection as well. She writes, quote, the words on the screen shift ever so slightly left and right as if projected from celluloid. The segment has been mastered to mimic gate weave, the horizontal drifting or darting back and forth that occurs when a warped film's perforation does not hug snugly to the sprocket. This effect recalls the experience of watching a silent era movie projected from celluloid onto the big screen awakening the historical awareness of the spectator. Um, and at the same time, the sequence, I think, is also redolent with digital effects. I mean, it's very clear that this sequence is digitally manipulated with this kind of layering um, of, of effects. And um, it kind of, in this sense, forms a palimpsest of past and present film aesthetics, which nicely encapsulates the style of the show as a whole. And the closing sequences of Babylon Berlin operate somewhat differently um, with each episode of seasons one and two, except for the final episode 16, featuring an ep excerpt from one of Walter Guttmann's Lichtspiel Opus 1 bis 4 films, a series of experimental animated films made between the, the years 1921 and 1925. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure, I didn't double check, but I'm pretty sure at least a couple of these can be found on YouTube still. Um, if you're interested in watching them, they're quite short, but um, really very beautiful. Um, and while these are actual excerpts from analog films, painstakingly made by Rotman in the 1920s on a frame by frame basis using oil paint on glass plates. He used this kind of special process of painting glass plates and then photographing the, the glass plate frame by frame. They look, I think, in a way strikingly contemporary and are kind of reminiscent of digital video animations from the present day, even looking sometimes like something like a screensaver um, that, you, that you might have on your computer. Um, Ruttmann was the director of Berlin Symphony of a Great City, Berlin Symphony on a from 1927, one of the most important films of the new ob objectivity, which we talked a lot about earlier on in this series. 
um, and one that notably influenced the visual language of Babylon Berlin, as you can see here, and this is actually a slide that I showed in the very first watch clutch, so I thought I'd come back around to that right now. Um, you can see how many um, setups in Babylon Berlin were kind of designed with this type of shot in mind. Uh, unlike the directors of People on Sunday, mentioned on Sonntag, which we've talked about a lot, however, all of whom left Germany as refugees from Hitler, Ruttmann stayed, and he went on to direct several films during the Third Reich, also working as a cinematographer on Leni Riefenstahl's infamous Nazi film, propaganda film, Triumph of the Will, Triumph des Willens from 1935. Like many characters in Babylon Berlin then, he was one of those people who, in showrunner Henlotin's Hen uh, terms, reacted to German society's changes, and in this case, made the decision to accommodate himself with Nazism, uh, making the inclusion of his films in the closing credits of the show so interested in tracing that kind of decision, um, particularly apropos. So I'm going to stop here and uh, stop the screen share and look forward to hearing uh, your questions, comments, ideas, and thoughts. All right. Thank you, Hess. Do you hear me? Yes. Testing out my, my office headphones that I haven't touched in four months. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, once again, um, it's really great that we've been able to have you with us for the last uh, couple of weeks to go through these episodes and sort of talk about these episodes with and unpack them with. And um, with that, I'm going to go right into some responses already to sort of some questions that you've um, and some comments that you've posed. Um, one from Marlon sort of um, sort of. Uh, touches upon what you were talking about with the duality of life, death, and all of these characters who seem to die and then come back to life again. You know, she says, why does Kartikov seem to be a cat with nine lives? But then again, it seems, you know, especially in these last two episodes that a lot of people take on these roles. Even Volta, who you think is dead when he gets shot by the Armenian or the, the gangsters, um, that work for the Armenian and he falls off and then it's like, nope, he's not dead. He's he's the terminator. Somehow, I mean, he's absolutely yeah. the terminator in these and, episodes. Yeah, like I bang my knee on a piece of furniture and I'm out of commission for days. He gets shot and can climb on top of a train and still fight Rat until the death, you know, and it's just, you know, I mean, yes, like it's it's very like, but um, and even also I was gonna say when you realize, at least maybe I didn't understand it quite right, but the fact that um, they all thought it was gas because they were paranoid about gas, but it was really something that uh, Chernevsky and Henning dropped that was actually not gas. It was like sleeping gas, right? And they were all going to wake up. So they're like, we have to get away before they come too, right? So, you know, they all thought they were going to die, but is that correct? Or did exactly, I not understand? Okay. Exactly. So Rat tells Henning and Chernevsky to bring, I can't remember what he did, like the emergency kit or whatever. Um, and so they, they, they put on their gas masks to protect them and then they drop this. Um, and people think it's gas leaking out of the train car as had happened when the car was parked in, in the Anhalter Bahnhof um, and, and the gas was let out of the train car they thought was the gold car, but actually wasn't, um, and, and people were killed. But this time it's a trick to try to dupe them um, and they all kind of pass out thinking they're gonna die, but in fact they don't. But then of course later, um, Rat shoots a hole in the train car that does have gas in it and Volter lights his cigarette and a spark flies and the actual phosgene is leaking out and blows Boom. the thing up. Yeah. Bye bye Volter. Yeah. And I was going to say, because we have a couple questions coming in that um, refer to sort of intertextuality, especially as it goes, as it, as it refers to sort of um, prominent media of today. Um, one thing, I mean, so I grew up watching James Bond movies a lot. I mean, that wasn't the only thing that I was watching, but I sort of watched the trajectory of James Bond movies going from like early 60s with Sean Connery to a little bit of camp, but they sort of took themselves seriously to by the time it was the later 60s, it was all camp, well into the 80s, all camp, and then sort of bringing back with like 
Pierce Brosnan in the 90s and then eventually Dan Daniel Craig, they were sort of taking things in a more serious direction. And I was kind of struck by the last episode at how much, the last two episodes, at how much they're, I don't know if you've seen the movie Cas Casino Royale, but how much it reminds me of that, um, specifically with the drowning scene, because in, I don't know if anybody in here has watched Casino Royale, but there's a scene where um, Ava Green's character, Vesper, um, she locks herself in um, the elevator of a sinking house in Venice, and he's trying to save her, but she's, from an earlier part in the movie, she's guilty because she kind of, um, she thinks that she betrayed him, so she tells him to stop, and she inhales water, and it's very, very similar to the way that Lotta stops Garion from uh, trying to to keep her alive the way he's doing, and she inhales water, and that was strikingly similar, and then the other thing that struck me as very sim similar was the idea of sort of watching as the smug villain thinks that they're getting away, but then suddenly they realize that they're doing something to undo themselves, so Walter lighting the cigarette and realizing that he's igniting the gas, I think in one of these unnamed henchmen, you know, he thinks he's about to walk away, and he realizes that he has a bomb strapped to his belt that Bond got there, like, you know, sort of surreptitiously and then he blows up um so i found that to be a little bit whereas in casino royale is like okay it's bond it feels like it feels like it makes sense in this and i think a couple of other people are sort of commenting on that as well it feels a little bit as marlon puts it very hollywood the chase for the train um UN mentions, I think with any other show, it'd be jumping the shark, but I think that the rest of the show is so over the top camp and unsubtle that it doesn't seem out of place. Um, and um, Linda also says, what did you make of the gunfight on the roof of the train? We've seen this in a number of films, haven't we? Do you think it was a deliberate nod to those other films? Um, and so, yeah, my, my James Bond speech, but also like some of the other folks who have sort of weighed in on the idea that this is not something that we haven't seen before. These are things that I think a lot of people who consume media um, can say, oh yeah, I saw something similar in this or something similar in that. And um, Yeah, I mean, it goes for the straight up kind of like um, some, I think Marlon said, sort of Hollywood style um, action sequences. And you can cite, I think, numerous examples of precursors or sort of citations, references for the drowning sequence, for the train sequence. I mean, these are really pretty common um, tropes of a lot of different action and, and genre films. Um, so yeah, I think that is what it's doing. It's it's kind of going in that direction of adopting a much more action oriented uh, Hollywood style. Uh, I think the James Bond reference is accurate. I mean, uh, also German cinema has a whole kind of history of of intersection with the Bond films. Uh, Gerhard Probe, who was a huge star of German film in the 50s, played Goldfinger and many other German actors. Lotta, what's Lotta Lenya? She played Lotta the lady with the blade right. in her foot in um, From Russia with Love. Many German, famous German actors played cameo roles in many of the Bond films, of course, during the Cold War era in particular. Um, and often use the opportunity of those films to camp it up so hardcore. So, I mean, I think <laughs> whole kind of interesting history that might be you know showing back up here in reverse or something like that which is certainly what the what the show does all the time as we've been exploring um so yeah i, I think all of those points are right on the money um you know my question was like did it cause you to kind of roll your eyes and <laughs> uh, that was my know, question too yeah kind of i was curious like, about oh that. my gosh what is this show doing now it's kind of selling selling itself short of you know, or, or moving towards these kind of gimmicky um, uh, gestures that it really, you know, doesn't need to do because we all, I mean, the show had, was immensely popular in, in all of the build up to those two episodes before making those kind of choices. So, you know, what is, you know, is it a, a craven marketing decision, <laughs> that, you know, yeah. to, to create some really kind of high budget sequences um, and, to create some really over the top cliffhangers, um, you know, or is it something a little bit more like, um, like pushing the envelope 
I think like Yi Wen maybe said in, in a comment on here, pushing the envelope on the kind of artifice and, and campiness um, that we've come to appreciate about the show um, in earlier episodes, just kind of taking them in a different direction. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'd be curious to hear other people's thoughts on whether a, a lot of people that I've talked to and when I've taught this with students before, also people really rejected these two episodes, especially the brutality towards Lata. Um, I mean, we talked last time about the fridging of Lata in the, in the freezer sequence um, and the, you know, kind of horrible treatment of, that she was subjected to by the, the Armenian and his thugs. Um, and here, just following right on the heels of that, we see her being subjected again to this kind of gratuitous brutality. Um, and I, I, since she kind of remains at this point our only hero, like the only figure that we are really still uh, identifying with or sympathetic towards, um, it, it seems especially gratuitous uh, to put her in this kind of situation. And like I said, I mean, really sort of um, this moment of her um, drowning and then being revived could only take a few seconds and the, the show just stretches it out and stretches it out. So if you watch episode 15, you're left really thinking she's dead. Um, and then she comes back sort of um, surprisingly at the start of episode 16, right? Yeah, and um, on that, I was going to, um, well, Jill submitted the question um, you've spoken brilliantly about intermediality in both seasons one and two, mostly with a focus on German film, Weimar film, and new German cinema. But the sensationalism of these final episodes, combined with your father's point in last week's Watch Clutch regarding the God Godfather, bleh, Godfather Part 3, leads me to ask, what about the various nods to three big Hollywood directors, Coppola, Scorsese, and Spielberg? Um, which I think kind of goes on with this, what we're talking about right now, which is the that episodes seven and three sort of pull us out from, you know, sort of the way we've been talking about how a lot of this stuff harkens back to older things, but these two episodes feel very new. And I can tell that some people are not responding. A lot of people are not responding like that well to it because I mean, it is interesting that when, when you sort of build a universe where it's almost like people are expecting it to not be super Hollywoodized when you find something that's like that, it feels, almost like it compounds not, I, I don't know, the disappointment or the jarringness of, of experiencing that in this particular universe. But what do you Yeah, think? I mean, I think it's a really, I think it's a really interesting point. Um, and of course, for me, as somebody who uh, is focuses on German cinema, it's, it's sort of less compelling to follow up on the numerous intertextual references um, to uh, these kind of classic Hollywood films, although I think they're certainly there. But I mean, one one way of looking at it may also be that you know Tom Tickber um, had a short career in Hollywood. He made a couple of films that were financed by Hollywood studios, um, and like many of his uh, forebears in German cinema who tried to go to Hollywood, he didn't really succeed in adapting his kind of aesthetic to um, the context of Hollywood. And then he, he decided to go back to Germany and um, do, do what he does best, um, making small budget German films. But he went to Hollywood like many German directors do because it's simply not possible most of the time to make the kind of action sequences that you see in episodes 15 and 16 in Germany because the, budget, the, the audience for German language cinema is normally just too small to break even on those kinds of really, you know, high cost uh, special effects and setups that are, are required to do that kind of um, that kind of action sequence. Um, and I know that when they first planned to make Babylon Berlin, they were thinking about doing it in English because they felt that a German language show of this budget and this caliber probably couldn't make it. Um, you know, because certainly attempts to make big budget German language films um, on this level haven't haven't um, paid off in the end. Um, and they decided to do it as a German language show in the end, I think partly um, inspired by some of the 
successes of Nordic Noir um, and uh, kind of other types of shows that had made it on a streaming platform, um, the kind of things that um, probably wouldn't have done well in cinemas, but that were uh, working well in the context of streaming um, media. So um, they did it and I, you know, I think they, they made obviously the right choice, um, but it's interesting to think about how much it must have been fun for them to <laughs> to do something with this huge budget that they had for this show that yeah. they don't normally get to do as German filmmakers in the German language shooting in Germany. Um, and that is like massive action and effects, the kind of thing that you would see in uh, like, a, you know, a, a Spielberg film or something like that. Yeah, and I was gonna say, um, Jill also added James Cameron to that list, and I had two other people that I had in mind when I was watching. Um, one being, um, well, uh, Ewen mentions this, Schmidt, who's connected to so many people and storylines secretly being Garyon's brother seems very convenient. And of course, I thought of Luke, I am your father. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then another thing that I thought of, maybe less le less note, but like Brian De Palma movies, like he made what he made Carrie, The Untouchables, um, you know, like Dressed to Kill. One thing that I find like really excruciating about Brian De Palma's movies, he oh, it, it, I think he thinks it's his trademark, but it's actually quite annoying where he'll linger on a scene and drag you along with it. I don't know if anybody remembers the scene from Carrie where she's being crowned prom queen and there's the blood bucket on top of the beam and it takes like 15 minutes for them to shake the rope and for it to fall and I'm just watching it like, I I'm over it. Like, I don't care anymore. Like, let it fall some, I I like, right. <laughs> he almost like, he he's very good at testing your patience. And there's another scene from The Untouchables where it's very similar where this woman's trying to get her baby in a stroller up like, 10 flights of stairs right before like a big gangster shootout is about to happen in 1920s Chicago. And you're just watching it like, can this lady do literally anything else except be on these stairs right now and moving this slow? And he knows that it's gonna drive you nuts. And so a little bit of that, especially as, as far as the thing with reviving Lotta went, I mean, watching that we were just, yes, exactly as you put it, tested your patience. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I mean, and it was interesting because I hadn't, um, I hadn't really been drawing any parallels at all to, to sort of, um, oh, Jill made an interesting comment. That scene from The Untouchables is a reference to Battleship Potemkin from mm. Eisenstein. I haven't actually like seen that movie all the way through. Baby so carriage on the stairway, yes. Yeah, so um, interesting, but yeah, I mean, I hadn't actually made a lot of these connections between Babylon Berlin and like more recent directors until these last two sort of um, scenes where I'm like, that's very that, that's very that. But um, yeah, that was just my input too. Um, but um, let's see. And just as some, some sort of um, feedback on generally like these two episodes, um, Linda says, the implausible surprise they're not dead scenes were a disappointing turn. Made me wonder if there were new writers on the show. Um, and let's see, um, Samantha says, I found so much of season two so emotionally stressful that it actually felt cathartic to finally see some kind of fast paced real time action again, even if it was over the top. And um, uh, Mary says, I was struck by the gunfight on top of the moving train. Like those I've seen in Western movies, the lighting was so vivid and expressionistic. So it's interesting, mm -hmm. the sort of different uh, reactions we have here um, to yeah, that's that. Great. great to hear people's responses to these different um, scenes. I really appreciate those uh, comments. Yeah. And Marlon actually also mentions another thing that I thought was an uh, interesting choice on the part of the creators. I was so pleased when Lotta finally got her badge because that was kind of a really nice high point of these two episodes. Although I did find it interesting that it came right off the tail end of Garyon committing perjury on the behalf of the police, which I don't think was a mistake at all. The idea that, you know, he's, um, you know, that, that he's gonna lie on behalf of the police, but then right on the tail end of that scene, she gets her badge. So it's like, yeah, I feel like it was on purpose that uh, 
the audience would be happy for her, which they are, but then again, it's like, oh, but that's also part of being a police officer. Yeah. You said it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was gonna say, um, let's see, what else? Because there's just as some, um, as far as some clarification, uh, Danielle, because I was wondering this too, Danielle asked, you mentioned Fritz and Otto got Greta the job in Benda's house. Can you explain that? I missed it. I forgot how she got the job. I also forgot how she got the job. Actually, I, I didn't totally follow up on this. So um, please somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that they kind of drop the advertisement for this position somehow um, uh, in her face or either they learn that she's applying for the position and so they zero in on her but there's a correlation one way or the other between um, their knowledge that she's pursuing the position and their choice to start um, yeah befriending her and grooming her. Um, so I, I, I meant to look back and double check on exactly how that transpired in season one, but I know that the two things were interconnected in some way from the very beginning. Jill in the chat mentions, she and Lotta are talking about the job ad on the deck, on the dock at the Wannsee. So uh -huh. given that those guys were sort of slinking around in that particular scene, they might've overheard that or, um, but yeah, I have to rewatch and see exactly how those two things correlated. I do remember, as many people have pointed out, that like it was Lotta who literally handed her the the Bavelbung. But um, I I remember Hester something similar to what you're remembering, which is that they were aware that she was trying to get the job with Vinda's family, but I don't remember exactly how. Um, um, some other comments on. Uh, on the sort of turn uh, that these two episodes take. Um, uh, Virginia says, I felt that I had missed something because the action seemed to take the story in a different direction. I didn't think it was necessary and I felt that it could have been filmed in a way that would have kept with the present storyline. Um, which, yeah, I thought was interesting too. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, like um, one person said, yeah, it felt too Hollywood. And my thinking being that so many things are Hollywood and so many things that we like out there are, you know, sort of typically Hollywood, but when something, I guess, presents itself to not be typically Hollywood and then takes some turns that are, it's, it, it doesn't feel right. <laughs> or I don't know, what do you think of that? Um, I'm sorry, I've, I was, <laughs> I was looking at the feedback about the, how Lotta got the job and I spaced out. I was going to say <laughs> the idea. How, how great to got the job. Uh, somebody pointed out that Lotta got the, the paper off the police board that yeah. Ben posted, which is, that reminds me that you're totally right about that. I think it is that they, they overheard her talking about it on the, on the dock, like Jill said, and, and that was the connection that they made. And so then they started pursuing her. So thank you for the, thank you for the recall on that one. Yeah. And okay, sorry, Riley, what were you, what were you asking me? <laughs> I was just going to say a lot of the sort of feedback about this particular way that this, the season ended, a lot of disappointment seems to lie in the show falling back on tropes, cliches, you know, of, um, typical Hollywood and I was thinking you know we have in you know sort of our cultural canon a lot of things that are typically Hollywood that people still like but I wonder and, and I, of course for everybody um, involved also like if, if it hadn't presented itself to be so non-Hollywood at the beginning would it be is that what makes it jarring is that the last two episodes sort of take some turns that are Hollywood-ish and that makes us go like, oh, I didn't want this. <laughs> you know, like I wanted something that was sort of, you know, a refreshing sort of, you know, diversion from these sort of Hollywood cliches. Um, I mean, I do think as we talked about that, the show was actually, you know, if we're using shorthand, Hollywood as shorthand for genre or whatever. I mean, in a way the show really has, um, has been drawing on those conventions all along. It's not that it hasn't, but it's been, it, you know, starts out as a more noirish sort of slow burning detective um, show kind of intermingled with some kind of 
social realist um, depictions of Berlin milieus, as well as kind of these intermedial references to the history of German cinema. Um, so in a way, these, these episodes don't depart so much from that. They're just swerving a little bit more towards the action thriller, as opposed to that sort of noirish style that um, that they started out with. Um, and I, I do think, I mean, we talked a lot about um, the show as a genre mix all along. I mean, um, you know, kind of um, serving itself at the buffet of, um, of world cinema to the pieces that work for the topics it wants to develop in a certain sense. Um, and so, you know, I don't think it's, um, it's that much of a departure in terms of its engagement with Hollywood per se, but I do think it's a departure in terms of moving out of the urban landscape, which is so characteristic of the setting up the noir film, um, you know, amping up the pace of things. Um, and again, as we talked about the kind of misogynist treatment of Lotta in particular, that, um, that seems to, for me, be the main difference um, of the show and this sort of starting the second half of season two um, to its early development of that character. And, um, you know, I think it's interesting to speculate on, on why that's the case. I mean, we talked a lot of last week about just simply the misogyny of popular cinema and its treatment of women characters. And I certainly think that that's a part of it. Um, I also think that um, there, there is something about the way that the show is moving towards a depiction of Nazism um, in these, in the latter half of this season um, that um, maybe has to do with its decision to, to emphasize the manipulation and brutality um, against female characters more so than it did before. I mean, it's really turning away from, with the exception of Lotta getting getting her badge, which as you point out is sort of, you know, paradoxical and it's a good side and it's bad side. Um, it, it's, the show really turns away from the depiction of the new woman um, that we saw at the outset, the kind of flapper style, emancipated kind of scrappy go-getter new woman. Um, and in season three, Helga plays a much more prominent role, for instance, um, who, who really was never characterized as that kind of um, female figure to begin with, so, yeah. Yeah, and I think as much as it's one of those proud moments that Lotta gets her, um, her badge, it also sort of takes you back to sort of one of the first things you mentioned about this show, which was that it examines how everybody in the show slowly accommodates a system that will once eventually, very soon, um, become um, become Nazism. And so you even see that in Lotta, who you think is, you know, um, you know, I mean, it's a step, you know, to become a police officer, you know, and to sort of make that move, I think. At least that was my take on it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But um, let's see. So um, Maggie asked, um, on the topic of Lotta, um, do her trials and tribulations harken back to the perils of Pauline in silent Hollywood cinema? Now, I'm not familiar with this film, are you? Yeah, that's a great point that I hadn't thought about before. Um, that would be really, really interesting to follow up on. It's been like a really long time since I saw that, but I think it is kind of a flapper style character, if I'm not mistaken, who um, then is ki kind of um, finds herself in all of these uh, complicated, difficult situations that she has to extricate herself from. And um, so it's both, and Maggie, please, correct me if I'm mistaken here, because it's, uh, it's going way back. Um, but kind of both um, brutality and mis misogyny against women that is so foundational for so much popular cinema, but also um, the kind of um, always kind of magically getting herself out of it, the, the undead quality that I was talking about in Babylon Berlin, maybe. That would be really interesting to follow up on. Mm -hmm. And also there's two sort of comments on the, the, the revelation that Anno is Rat's brother. Um, Jill comments, um, 
I agree with you. When the, the reference to Star Wars that I made uh, alludes to the series sort of schlocky use of the return of the repressed, again, pop Freudianism that I've mentioned before. Um, and then Antonio says, what I find amazing is the turns the story take totally unexpected, like uh, Anno Schmidt and Gary on being, being brothers or the train cargo being fake and some many parties looking to get their hands on it. And of course, then nobody knowing that it's the train car itself that's gold um, or the duplicity of all characters. I think it's brilliant. I don't care whether it's Hollywood <laughs> or not. And yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people like. Yeah, I mean, clearly we're good. all very animated by this show or else we wouldn't have spent <laughs> seven yeah. sessions um, talking about it in great detail. And so I really appreciate you reminding us of that point. Yes, we love it. <laughs> yeah, and like, I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it is, I mean, it's a thoughtful show, but also, I mean, it is there to entertain. So, I mean, if they decided to do some, <laughs> you know, I mean, sometimes it's frustrating with writers, but if they, if they decide, oh, we just want to, we just want to do some indulgent, you know, just Michael Bay bullet explosion moments, you know, or whatever, you know, that even if they are, you know, sort of related to the plot, you know, like, then they'll do it. And <laughs> but yeah, I was going to say, what else? Um, so Mary says, um, the first appearance of Nazis, along with the scenes outside, invited me to feel the looming Nazi presence and the impossibility or difficulty for Jews after a few years to escape, and how Jews had to stay claustrophobically in hiding. There was a great book written with stories of Jews who survived the war hiding, contrasted that with beauty of the countryside free movement. To me, it made the coming horror more vivid. What do others think? Yeah, thank you for that point. I, I mean, I was, um, I was kind of hinting in that direction um, with my question for this week about how you viewed this kind of interesting choice to move out of the city and into all of these wide open exterior spaces as opposed to kind of the interiors and how that um, choice, uh, as well as the lack of depictions of domestic spaces, except for the single one that we see Benda's home, which gets blown up, um, how, how that goes hand in hand with the rise of Nazism that the show is tracking. And um, so I, I, I think your point is well taken. And it also made me, th your, your question also made me think of two things. One, the idea of Lebensraum, <laughs> you know, like we need to spread out, which means go beyond the borders of where we're supposed to be and, you know, um, enter into a bunch of other spaces where we're not supposed to be and just sort of walk into other people's countries and say, this is ours now. Um, which, you know, I, I, at least for my research is very closely associated with the idea of the German people need fresh air so that they can roam around like, they're, you know, like they're cattle or something. Like they need fresh air and green grass and the mountains and the sky. And so that was certainly one little thing I had in mind when they sort of took to the countryside. Um, Another thing that came to mind um, was, especially with Benda's house, um, the, it made me think of the Jenny Erpenbeck novel that I actually think I read in your seminar, God, I don't know how many years ago, but Heimsuchung or Visitation about a house that's on a, on a lake, you know, in, in Brandenburg um, and how it goes through many different ownerships and lives throughout its life and one of them being that it was a, it's a beautiful house that was owned by a Jewish family. And then when the Jewish family was ultimately arrested and deported, it was just given to another group of people who just walked right into it. And I found it not only um, significant, the destruction of Benda's house in the sense that it sort of um, symbolically sort of destroys this, you know, line between the domestic and private, or the domestic and public spheres in society or moves closer to that, but also, it, to me, it sort of um, reminded me of that thing that was to come, which was that Jewish people were going to have their land and their homes ripped out from underneath them completely and literally given to other people uh, in the coming years. And that the domestic sphere for Jewish people in Germany was about to not exist at all anymore. Yeah. And that's the, the, this kind of dual uh, violence, eliminationist violence against people and property. Um, absolutely. Um, and so this is actually an interesting note on uh, language um, that anybody who 
speaks German here or may not speak German, still might find interesting. Um, Jill pointed out, did anyone notice the very cool use of du and then Z when Greta confronts Fritz mm -hmm. at the station? He starts out by saying, du musst mich verwechseln, which means like you must have me mixed up for somebody else. Um, he starts out by saying, du musst mich verwechseln and then shifts to sie müssen mich verwechseln. So he goes from the formal to the, sorry, he goes from the informal to the formal. Uh, she says, that's one of the subtle moments of writing that are missed who does, those who don't, who don't speak the language, which I thought was an interesting point too. Um, and yeah, another there, one. Yeah. Sorry, there's a great, there's a great part of that sequence too, which is a clip that I maybe would have shown if I had shown a clip tonight, um, which is that Otto, uh, it's something about cinematography that kind of also connects with what you're saying about language here. Um, a great a glimpses Otto in the crowd of, of Nazis first, and then she watches Otto's eyes looking at another person who Greta can only see from the back, but it's obviously it's Fritz. Um, and Greta sees his eyes after they look at her track to Fritz, and the camera kind of pans following Otto's eye line. Um, and then reverses to show us Greta. And that's when she is moved to look more closely at the crowd. And then she sees Fritz first from the side. Um, and then when he turns around, you know, his, his full face. Um, and uh, it parallels this point about language because they're trying to, you know, shroud what they're doing in in mystery and pretend like they don't know her but the combination of language and this kind of eyeline match um, demonstrates the the reality of the situation so it's another really nice play with this question of sort of appearances versus um, realities and the sort of doubles and deceptions that the show really traffics in yeah and another um Another notable moment of, of, of that switching between Z and Du or vice versa happens, uh, as Samantha points out, with Geryon and Lotta in these last two episodes. Um, I don't remember exactly officially when it happens, but the first time that I noticed it was right after he pulls her out of the water and puts her in the back of the car. Graf is about to drive off with her and she says, Geryon, sei vorsichtig, which yeah. is not seien sie vorsichtig, you know, yeah. so I don't know if he, if they say something before that, but yeah, up, up until then there was sort of a, they were sort of messy in there uh, for a little bit in, in their addressing of each other, first name basis, but still Z, and then, you know, but then it seemed like finally it was like, okay, you pulled me out of the water and revived me back from death, like we can be on a do basis now. Yeah, they are actually regularly switching in their relationship back and forth between Z and do. Yeah. Time. And it's quite interesting to track because, um, you know, it, it, it definitely codes the degree of coolness or hotness in their relationship um, as to what, what uh, address form they're choosing. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, let's see. Uh, so, so just on the topic of also Lotta um, becoming a police officer and getting her badge in this moment, Mary Helen comments, um, agreed about the turn away from the new woman. Geryon also seems to embody a more conventional masculinity in the last couple of episodes of season two than in previous episodes. Yeah, I mean, great point. And there seems to be, um, you know, so, some of this has to do, in Geryon's characterization, has to do with the arrival of Helga and this idea of them forming this kind of heteronormative coupledom that is different than, maybe a little bit different than the kind of um, experimentation he's been doing in her, her absence, right? Um, so yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and it's, it's interesting to think about in terms of the developments um, moving forward in season three, thinking about the gendering of the characters um, as, it, um, as it unfolds in season three. So we'll hold that thought for next season. Yeah, and also just um, Danielle has asked the question just for non-German speakers, um, explaining the formal versus informal um, addressing um, of people. Hester, do you want to do that? Yeah, sure. So German, like like many other languages, has a formal and an informal U um, 
pronoun. And so um, people usually address, adults usually address one another using the formal version of you until they know one another um, or offer one another the familiar form. Um, and so, uh, you know, professionals who are work colleagues, you know, especially during this period would often address one another using the formal um, way of speaking, uh, almost something like using a title, you know, calling one another Mr. or so-and-so instead of, you know, by first names. Um, and uh, so Lotta and Rat begin by addressing each other formally, but um, they're often slipping into this more intimate form of address, even though they have never sort of cemented their friendship and offered one another the opportunity to address one another in familiar terms. Um, but, you know, they kiss, for example, and then they get into all kinds of, you know, <laughs> crazy scrapes like drowning and, <laughs> yeah. and things that, that might lead them to be more familiar with one another. And um, so in, in, the, in the German dialogue, this is used very carefully by the writers. Um, and Fritz and Greta, of course, were a couple. And so they, of course, use the familiar mode of address with one another. Um, and Fritz, when he sees Greta on the train platform, slips back into that familiar mode of address, even though um, he ostensibly is saying, like, you're mixing me up with someone else. I don't, I don't know you at all. And he's pretending to be a completely different person. Um, but that, that use of the informal familiar um, pronoun is giving him away a little bit. Yeah. And I can also say just in modern day, because somebody mentioned this as well in, in terms of modern day workplaces, um, working at Goethe, where we all speak German all the time, um, we're more on the do form with each other, even if we don't know each other. So things have changed. Um, I have one colleague who um, asks us to sitz him, but he sitzes us as well and calls me Herr Joyner and I call him Herr Blank. And so um, there are some people who still sort of um, would rather stick to that, but for the most part, yeah, in the German workplace right now, um, at least in my workplace, where we speak German, we do each other, even if we're not that familiar with each other. Um, so it has changed indeed. It has and changed dramatically in public spaces. I mean, even in my own time as a German learner and somebody traveling and, and living and working in Germany, um, it used to be much, much more common, for instance, in public spaces, like or cafes, restaurants, or things like that, that you would always use the formal, but now it's very common to use the, the informal, the familiar. And also, on, I, I don't want to get it too complicated with language things, but one thing that I also noticed that um, a very outmodish sort of way of addressing people was the way Moritz addresses um, Garion with the ear, the um, almost using like the second person, what's now known as the second person um, plural formal, like you're talking to two people, you say ihr habt zwei Äpfel or whatever, you know, like he addresses Gary on that way, which I found interesting because I didn't know that that was even something people were still doing in the 20s, but I don't know. Language reform is a whole other sort of topic. <laughs> um, Jill actually um, made a, an interesting comment um, about the, the Armenian and his sort of squad rolling up uh, at the, the train hold up. Uh, she says, has anyone been happier to see the gangsters appear than we are when they emerge from the tall grass and take down the guys from the Schwarzer Reichswehr? My point is that some, that there are some deliciously gratifying moments of viewing amid the frustration. I liked that scene a lot. <laughs> it's a great scene. It is. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of Francis Ford Coppola, it reminded, it was a little bit apocalypse now to me, the way they sort of rise out of the grass, because you're like, who are these guys? You know, like, you just start to see the Schwarzer Reichswehr guys sort of get shot, and then they fall to the ground, and I, uh, Chernevsky and, and uh, Henning are looking at each other like, we didn't invite these people, who are they? You know, like, who's about to come out of the grass? And they all sort of come out of the grass at once, and it's, um, yeah, the Armenians uh, squad, which, yeah, reminded me of sort of, a, you know, the famous uh, Martin Sheen coming up above the water, or, you know, in general, the idea of tall grasses and vegetation being used in movies 
Yes, uh, there's especially. the Godfather sequence with, with the, the people, the armed dudes coming out of the tall grass too, I believe. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, but we do learn now finally here why it is that the Armenian is always saving Rat's life, which happens on multiple occasions, including one time that I didn't mention in, in one of these episodes um, when uh, Dr. Felker and some of her uh, henchmen, uh, they grab Rat and they put a bag over his head wanting to kill him for his perjury testimony, right? Um, and they put a gun to his head and it seems certain that he's going to die. And then the Armenian uh, comes and picks off the, the guy who's about to shoot Rat and saves his life once again. So we do now understand some of the motivation behind why that is happening repeatedly, which is that the Armenian is in debt to Anno Schmidt for helping him overcome his own PTSD. Um, and uh, Anno has made it clear that he wants to have his brother's life saved. Um, so this is um, a plot point that was never really made clear across the seasons, um, why the Armenian was kind of intervening in Tarat's um, <laughs> business again and again. And, and now we, we've begun to understand that. And this story of Anno Schmidt and um, his relationship with Rat and so forth plays an important role in season three as well. So they are laying the groundwork for um, new developments that begin to unfold. And um, one thing I, well, Marlon asked the question, has anyone considered that the rise of Helga could be related to the popularity of the actress playing the role? She played Julia in Weissense, a very popular television series about before and after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that did make me think, you know, about just in general, the star power of certain people in the show. Um, for instance, the guy playing Zergibel, I instantly, it's hard to miss him but it's, you know, you instantly clock him as the slimy, um, I forget what position he had, but the guy from, he's much oh, older, but that's named der Anderen. Um, and um, Volker Bruch himself was in that show that was very popular, Unsere Väter, Unsere Mütter, right? Uh, about World which War II. Which was shown on Netflix under the title Generation War, if I'm not mistaken. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. Helga is played by Hannah Herzsprung, who's a very popular actor, as you mentioned, in Weissense, which um, was a prior a series uh, from Germany that did quite well abroad. Um, and uh, Hannah Herzsprung is also a major actor of German cinema, so she's in a lot of films yeah. and is, is quite popular. Um, so, I mean, I certainly think that um, the the you know, casting decisions are very important in Babylon Berlin and they have, um, you know, procured the most stellar cast of, of actors, you know, um, almost even, almost every small role is played by a very prominent actor of stage or, and or screen in, in Germany. And so I certainly think that does play a role. Um, although that doesn't mean that they have to characterize her in the way that they do. And so I think, you know, that there is um, some significance to the, the, um, the character coming to be more of a central figure you know, that has something to do with the popularity of the actor, but it also has to do with a different style of femininity that she uh, portrays, I think. Yeah. And what was I, let's see. Um, Samantha posed the question. Um, I recall that the first two seasons were filmed together, but am I correct in understanding that the third season was not confirmed until afterward? These talks about genre and treatment of women will be interesting to revisit in the context of season three. Without spoiling or trying not to, I wonder how intentionally the genre inflictions moved the pacing and action of the story away from the Bruno plot and toward the more fantastical elements of the Stummer Tod, uh, part of season three too, by which I mean, was it intentional to allow more space for more drama? Mm, interesting point. I mean, I, yes, it's, it's correct, the first two seasons were filmed together, and as far as I understand it, um, the third season was not green-lighted until after the first two seasons were wrapped, and, and uh, once it became clear that the show was mega popular all around the world, um, then they approved a budget for season three. Um, so they 
wrapped up season two with the idea that that might be the end of the show. And, um, and that's why I was saying, you know, I, I do think there may be a way in which they were um, experimenting a little bit in these final two um, episodes with what kind of action, you know, and big budget style sequences they're capable of shooting and, and doing a great job shooting um, as a as a kind of stepping stone towards season three. I think that's certainly part of it. And yes, I agree. Um, it, season three is more dramatic in a certain kind of way than the first season and the first kind of half of season two. Um, and so I think, I think you make a great point. And yes, following gender and genre forward is particularly interesting in season three because it takes place in the film industry. It focuses on a crime that takes place during the shooting of a silent film. Um, and that scenario offers season three, you know, a great deal of space to engage with a lot of the themes and topics that I've been talking about here, audiovisuality and the rise of modern media and so forth. Um, but it also focuses a lot on women's depiction in cinema, um, early cinema um, directly. So it makes this, these topics really interesting to follow forward. Yeah. And Linda actually posed a question that I thought was interesting because um, it's not something that we've discussed super in depth um, about interior and setting design. Um, and she just commented that the interior decor of Benda's home seemed very different to all the others, which have a lot of heavy floral decor. His mm -hmm. seems more modern or is it art deco? I was thinking about that too when I saw his house. That's interesting. I, um, I wouldn't say it's, Art Deco, although, uh, no, yeah, not sure I paid that close attention to it. Um, so maybe there are components of that, but it's definitely like lighter and more modern. I mean, the lighter on the wood, a lot of wood and um, the China is more modern and overall it seems to be this very modern villa. And I agree a lot of the, um, the other homes and the interiors that we see um, are are more um, old school in their sort of middle class uh, style. And of course, the interior decor uh, of the characters says something about the characters, right? And um, the, the main interiors that we see are the interior of Bruno and Emmy's home. And they are, of course, aligned with this more, this idea of tradition. Um, and um, uh, allegiance to the way things used to be and the decor of their home maybe speaks to that. Um, and, uh, and then we see um, Binka's apartment and she, um, you know, is a impoverished war widow who, who has a pre-war apartment that she hasn't really changed because she makes her living from um, renting out rooms, subletting rooms to tenants. And so, yeah, I think you make a great point. The decor of Benda's is definitely indicative of his own kind of position as a modern, uh, per modern, you know, person, a person who embraces um, the present of the of the Weimar democracy and uh, is a, a major uh, representative of that. Just as an intro, oh, Hester, maybe you, maybe you agree or not, but I was just going to say, of all the interior, of all the domestic interiors represented in the show, the one that in fact is probably the most coveted now in <laughs> Berlin among the young folks is Lotta's house, which is in Neukölln, which you could pay a killing to get like a really tiny closet sized room. I mean, they went ahead and they renovated all of those buildings to some degree. Um, but yeah, isn't that, I just thought that that was interesting. Seeing that depiction of Neukölln and going, yeah, I mean, I've been in friends flats in Neukölln that look just like that. I mean, they're not in those conditions, but the same buildings, a lot of them, and people pay a lot for that rent after the gentrification of Neukölln. Yeah. That was an interesting side thing. Um, but uh, let's see. Um, oh, and also Virginia mentions, um, she asks, was the scene with Fritz the first time they showed soldiers with the Nazi emblem? Is that the first time it makes an appearance at all? I believe so, yeah. In my viewing, that is the first time I saw it, so please correct me if anyone else noticed it earlier, but uh, it's my 
um, observation that that is the case and that it's very important really for the show that it never does show that symbol previously, um, that it really withholds that symbolism and it, you know, connects to the, um, you know, to the idea that uh, the showrunners feel that that symbolism is really overdetermined, especially in German cinema and media, and that they wanted to really focus on um, the rise of Nazism without relying on all of the signifiers in order to make us kind of follow this idea that the characters don't really know that that symbolism is so is going to turn out to be as important as it is. Um, and so they only really show it here where it becomes really crucially important um, in, in Greta's, um, you know, process of slowly coming to understand what's actually happening. Yeah. And um, what was I going to say? Oh, I blinked. Matter. <laughs> um, but uh, let's see. Michelle had um, one small reflection. She says, taking the wide view of the first two seasons, but thinking narrowly on the use of the iris at the beginning of each episode, an obvious nod to silent films. I enjoyed that all except one episode uses the opening iris pulling us into each ride. But the one where Kartikov falls into the water holding, holding the red book is the only one that has a closing iris that forces us to concentrate on his hand holding the book, which closes our understanding, um, closes on our understanding of the importance of this book. That will later be revealed to have saved his life. I'm a fan of the iris and enjoyed it in Babylon Berlin. Thanks. I do too. Thank like the you, iris. Michelle. I love the iris too. Um, and I do, I, I was, I didn't end up talking about it in the context of the opening credit sequence, but it is noteworthy that the credit sequence, which plays with irises in its construction, then virtually always concludes with an iris shot um, that opens up then, um, as you point out. And, and that's one thing that I always really enjoy about the show. Often there's an iris shot actually on an eye or an iris as well in the show. So um, that's a nice feature, yeah. And Maggie also said in the chat, or does it show him making a fist, which I seem to recall something like that too, where it closed in on the book, but also I thought it was supposed to indicate to us that he's not dead, um, that he was moving. Um, he's holding the book, but which of course is what <laughs> saved him because he's holding it and that's what the bullet went into. Well, but then, the yes. yeah, so it's like the book holding, <laughs> the book thing being the thing that saved him and then the hand moving, showing that he's still alive with the bullet in the book. Um, yeah. And another thing on top of the idea of um, the question about um, the Nazi symbolism being the first, being first shown here, um, if I do recall, it was uh, Otto and Fritz who also have so far been the only people to mention Adolf Hitler by name. Um, and they were doing it in the Wannsee when they were watching the rich people sort of do their rowing race. And I don't remember exactly what the context of that conversation was. Somebody might be able to fill me in on that. Um, they were sort of making a smart, smart ass comment about how much they, you know, were hating these rich people going by in these, uh, in these rowboats. And I forget what he's, one of them asks the other one a question and the other guy goes, Adolf Hitler. And he's like, no, it's, you know, I forget exactly what it was, but. Um, You're talking about Lenin, I think. Or, yeah, yeah. I can't exactly remember either, but yeah, it's definitely planting the, planting the seed that, um, that they are, may not be what they seem. Yeah. And um, so I was going to ask one sort of final sort of overarching question before sort of closing the webinar. And then if anybody wants to join us in the post clutch clutch, uh, <laughs> they are free, free to do so. Um, but sort of going back to not only the conversation of um, about the police that we had a couple weeks ago, you know, the way the show sort of interrogates the role of the police in this show, um, especially something that we can't, of course, or something that, yeah, we can't help but notice in, in the times that are going on right now, um, but also just the idea of um, throughout these conversations, I've noticed a lot of um, 
you know, like we keep coming back to the conversation about how Volta is very complex and how um, uh, and how Rat is very complex and how all of these characters who work with or for the police in some way are complex and it makes it difficult to sort of reconcile the fact that they are working for or with or protecting in some way Benda, uh, this corrupt and yeah, sometimes evil or violent, hateful system. Um, at the same time, they are as, as people sort of um, generally decent with the exception of, of Walter um, in, in most cases. But I was gonna say, um, it just seemed interesting to me because um, I was thinking of a lot of movies that sort of go back to this sort of trope of the way that Volta and Rat are at the beginning where it reminded me sort of of like Training Day or like, um, I don't know, a, a lot of those kinds of movies where like sort of somebody who's sort of new sort of comes under the wing of somebody who uh, is much more experienced but is also uh, corrupted um, and the idea that um, it, I just was curious about, and maybe this is something we can keep talking about, I don't know, later, but the idea of, um, it feels like, I mean, even I had this, you know, sort of reaction where it's just like, and I wondered, I was like, why do I still have any faith in some of these institutions at all, where I'm like, what? That's, he's doing something bad and he works for those guys. <laughs> you know, like, um, it is interesting that we still have you know, trouble sort of reconciling the idea that, yeah, this person as a person might be good or might be complex, but the things that they're doing are very bad and that both things sometimes exist at the same time. And, you know, I don't know. That was one thought that I had sort of in closing, not very well expressed, but, you know. You know, I, mean, I do think that that's a strength of the show um, is to demonstrate is to draw us into these characters, you know? And in the case of Volta, I know people keep, uh, also in some of the comments out there tonight, people keep talking about that character and last week, especially before, maybe some people have watched the, the finale of the show and didn't exactly know how, how he is unmasked as really being quite awful um, in, the, in the final two episodes. Um, people are, are really reluctant to, um, to dismiss him because also the actor is so fantastic, Petar Kortz, and, and so good at, um, at lending complexity to the character um, that we're really, really drawn in. Um, and I, I think that they do a great job in the writing and in the acting of the show to draw us into these characters to not make us dismiss them as sort of, you know, cardboard cutout type one dimensional um, stereotypes which Nazis are so often portrayed as or also as you mentioned the lives of others you know sort of East German um, figures like some of the the actors who are in this this show also played um, you know prominent functionaries of the GDR state and in, in films like the lives of others and so often these figures are depicted in such a one-dimensional way and and I, you know I said all along and I'll say again that I do think you know one of the strengths of this show is this kind of very slow building to um, to the idea that all of these characters, virtually all of them, will be um, accommodating themselves to Nazism um, sooner or later. Um, and Jill also made a good observation. She said um, that it should be noted that um, there were people within the Weimar uh, era Berlin police who did put up a great uh, resistance to the Nazis. So we do have to be careful to not conflate the two. So yeah. Uh, there were people who were not down with the Nazis and not ready to accommodate the rise of the Third Reich. Um, so I wish, well, I wish that we could continue to, you know, take questions in this webinar, but um, I just figured uh, this was sort of an impromptu thing, but um, to set up a meeting where, I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen. We can figure that out, but um, <laughs> just because it's the last one. Um, and so if anybody would like to jump over to that link, which I dropped in the chat and also emailed out, um, feel free to do that. Um, but in conclusion of this webinar, I just wanted to say again, thank you so much to Hester for um, for sort of guiding us through these two seasons of Babylon Berlin. It was a really fun thing to sort of come to you with this project 
in April and say, hey, like, I don't know when we're going to be able to start negotiating rights for streaming things. Um, I don't know how long this is going to go on for. Let's just maybe see if we can ask people to go and watch Babylon Berlin and then we'll talk about it. And that was sort of how this, and Hester was like, I'm on board. And that was sort of how this started to unfold. Um, and so I'm really glad that Hester agreed to join us and do this. Um, I think she was the perfect person for it. And I'm really glad that uh, people have responded really well to this and that there does seem to be interest in continuing it, although it would most likely be next summer after hopefully season four also is out. Because um, I as I did mention last week, um, apparently they are shooting because I reached out to the agent of the two main actors and she was like, well, they can't really do it because they're filming right now. So fingers pressed or thumbs pressed that uh, maybe they're not just happening to shoot some bad rom-com that they're in together. They're actually shooting Babylon Berlin. Um, but um, yeah, so once again, thank you so much for joining us in these conversations. It's been really fun. Thank you again to Foggy who has, um, who has generously supported this programming and once again uh, is continuing to sort of um, uh, support this programming because as I mentioned, stay tuned. We do have two other things sort of in the works that are related to Babylon Berlin, um, which I think that you guys will really enjoy. Um, they're exciting to me because they involve you know, direct context that um, we have in Berlin and hopefully making something virtual out of that. So I will just say that much just for now so that I don't raise too much anticipation. But um, I yeah. really appreciate everyone, all the great comments and participation. It gave me a lot to think about. Um, really exciting. And uh, just to say the idea is if you click on the other Zoom meeting in a moment, that everyone's um, enabled to see your face and hear your voice, which would be yes. really cool for me since I see only your names and comments. But um, if I don't know you already personally, I, I don't know, you know, what you look like or anything. And it would be fun since I'm always feeling a little, like it's a little uncanny to transmit my broadcast myself out into this void. Um, that'd be really fun to um, see people's faces and, and have a conversation um, that way. So if you feel like it, please jump over there. And I just wanna thank Raleigh again for, for this. It has been a great way to occupy our time during quarantine and to keep up a conversation um, about something in a really fun um, interactive platform. So thanks a ton. Thank you all. And thank you, Hester, again. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump off of here and go open up the other thing, the other thing, the other, the other room. So um, we may see you in the other room. We may not. Um, if you uh, Thanks again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We will see you around, if not at the other room. <laughs>